We have our Ruby series continuing. We had Matt's uh, last week, and now we go over to the, the Java side of uh, the Ruby house. And uh, Matt's kind of said a little bit in his talk last time how it was a bit of a bittersweet uh, taste with JRuby um, being a little bit faster than, uh, than his uh, interpreter. And um, so now we get to hear from one of the guys that uh, made a big difference to give us those uh, performance improvements. So let's give a hand to Ola. Thank you. Um, it's wonderful to be here. I actually haven't been further down than SFO in this area before. So coming down to Google and see all the stuff and feel the vibe here is, is nice. So yes, JRuby, uh, what, why, and how? It's actually, I mean, I have lots of slides, but I'm going to keep it kind of open. So if anyone has any questions, anything you want me to expand more on, uh, just feel free to say so. And I'm sure we can accommodate that. Um, I am from Sweden, so if you're wondering where my accent is from, that is it. Um, I am a programming language nerd. I'm not an educated one. I'm just dabbling in them. I've been the JRuby core developer, uh, one of the JRuby core developers for two years and spent two and a half years trying to make JRuby one of the best Ruby implementation available. I happen to be the author of Practical JRuby on Rails too. Um, it's the only book on JRuby right now. So if you're interested in JRuby and JRuby on Rails, yeah, that's the choice you have. I'm not endorsing it, I'm just saying. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Java versus Ruby first of all. Um, I am sure all of you are kind of familiar with a little bit, actually, I'm not sure. Ruby, how many people are familiar with Ruby? OK, so this is good. So this is not going to come as a surprise. I'm going to focus on a few of the aspects that make Ruby a different language and different and more useful for other problem domains that may, where Java might not actually be so well suited. Uh, I'm going to talk about JRuby, obviously, how to get started, some problems with Ruby that actually JRuby solves. And I'm going to take a look at the implementation. And that's where the real language geekery comes in. And I'm going to end up looking at some cool things, possibly some Rails, possibly not some Rails, depending on people being tired of hearing about Rails all the time. Uh, and some plenty of room for Q&A. So let's start with my first demonstration. And this is actually, I usually do this live coding, but I'm not going to do it this time. So you'll have to bear with me having a pre-canned example for this one. So I have this code here. It's, it's about a screen full of really readable code, right? Uh, so I'm wondering, what's the actual purpose of this code? Where is the business logic? I can describe what this code does in less characters than I actually need to get it to compile in Java. I can actually describe it as saying, create a list of these names. I want to sort it by length, and then I want to print them out separated by a comma. I don't know how many syllables that is, but I'm sure I'm around the main statement if I, if I kind of did a count. So let me just for comparison, OK, not normal. So this is the Ruby equivalent. Now uh, here we're actually talking about the same length of code for what I said. Uh, there are lots of things that we tell the Java compiler that we shouldn't really tell it. We tell it for once, we tell it two times that we need to do a list of string. That is kind of annoying. Here, we don't really care what the list is of because we know that we're just sending in strings. We are sorting by length and we are joining them by a comma and then we are printing them. If you have Ruby 1.9 or the active support extensions, you can actually just say sort by length and we don't need to even have this this uh, implicit, this uh, variable called name here to make that example. So that was just a very short comparison. Uh, and I'm going to come back to that later on. So the thing is, there are a few things that are extremely verbose in Java. The base language is verbose. And you don't really have that many things that can help you to abstract things. So. Ruby, you have blocks. Blocks help you to abstract things quite heavily, actually, because you have real closures. You have modules that can access mixins. That means that you can actually share behavior, uh, shared behavior that doesn't really depend on implementation. You can still have a shared implementation for stuff that just depends on something. Something. It doesn't really matter. And then you have the metaprogramming. Whoa. Oh, OK. 
Metaprogramming, which is really useful if you really want to compress things for real. I happen to be one of those Lisp guys who prefer common Lisp uh, real style macros. So compressibility and readability doesn't really have to go in opposite directions. I believe that with Ruby's metaprogram facilities, you can create small languages that are extremely readable but still expresses exactly the business intent of your code and nothing else. And it can actually expand into something that is a really good implementation that gives you all the uh, secondary things that you actually need from a business implementation. There are, at the end of the day, there are more means of abstraction, and that is really what matters. The more ways you can abstract something, the more choices you have to make your implementation readable, understandable, maintainable. So I mentioned verbosity. That is one of the things. Ruby also is not a malleable language. No, sorry, Java is not a malleable language. You can't really change the way anything works. Just take a typical example. Ruby, you can leave off the parentheses on a method call. That means that you can choose which looks, greater, which looks better. If you want to do a DSL, you usually end up not having parentheses. So you can do something that is readable in a different way. Also, the malleability of the language makes it easier to have a quick turnaround. You have an agile way of working where you can actually change the application in real time. While the customer is sitting by your side, you can change it and you can accomplish things without actually having to do a long compile cycle and so on. Of course, you have all that stuff with a test cycle in Ruby too, but to actually just spike functionality, you can do it faster. And DSLs, well, you can say lots about DSLs. They are one of the hype words right now, I would say. And Ruby is better at it than Java. I would say it would be very hard to write a domain-specific language inside of Java. You would actually have to just go outside and use a parse generator or something like that. Ruby is also full of innovation right now. I point at Rails as an example of the innovation that can happen if a language frees you to actually don't care about things that doesn't matter when you're doing something, when you wanna do, when you wanna do exploratory programming, for example. You don't really care about the types of your list. You just wanna have a list of something that you can shove things in, take things out of, can change it in some way, et cetera. And that kind of exploratory programming ends up being really hard in Java. Of course, you can start out in Ruby and then transform into Java, but that kind of programming is really, when you have invested lots of amount of time in exploring an implementation with Ruby, uh, most programmers doesn't really feel comfortable translating this into Java and see the source code explode with type tags. So it doesn't end up happening that much. But we're seeing that Rails, for example, has a real effect on programming language environments outside of the Ruby world. We're seeing that Java frameworks is actually taking up the learnings from Rails and putting them into the Java world. And this is happening in other areas too. You have stuff like testing, for example, where RSpec is leading the way of behavior-driven development. Now, this started out with JBehave, um, which quickly got turned into RBehave, and RBehave got m merged into RSpec and this is where all the new stuff is actually happening. So it's, in, to me, it's a matter of language power. In some situations, Java makes sense. In some other situations, Ruby makes sense. And the important thing is to actually choose which is which. So JRuby is an implementation of the Ruby language. It runs on top of the JVM. It's 1.5 compatible in the current trunk. We have a 1.0 release that we are maintaining that is 1.4 uh, compatible. You can also use Retroviewer to get 1.4 compatibility of JRuby. It's fully open source. You can choose which license you want to use. You can use GPL, CPL, and yeah, some uh, BSD-like license. So it's kind of free. One of the things that I end up saying every time I stand here talking about JRuby is that JRuby can be a little bit boring because it's really Ruby. It works exactly like Ruby. It is the Ruby language. There is no difference. Well, there's slight differences, but differences are extremely small compared to the fact that basically the whole language is there. It's compatible with Ruby 186. We count compatibility basically by doing lots of testing against different testing frameworks and specifications that exist, and we also basically you just run application frameworks. So when Rails and RSpec and a few other of the most complicated Ruby systems out there 
actually work flawlessly. That means that we are compatible. Our current release is uh, 1.1 RC2. We are planning on having an RC3 out this week or this weekend, hopefully. If I get the time to pitch in, it might actually happen. Uh, we do have the 1.0 branch I mentioned. It's kind of falling behind, though, because we can't really backport some of the, some of the more cool stuff we've been adding in the 1.1 branch. So we are probably going to continue doing bug fixes, but if you want to be actually getting the full Ruby treatment, JRuby 1.0 is going to be that. The product is old. It actually started in 2001, and we have had lots of different developers. The current oldest longest developer is Tom Enibo. He's been around in the project for four years. Uh, I joined two and a half years ago, and well, that is really it. We have had lots of people just going into the community and get then going out of it. Right now, we have eight core developers, 40, 50 contributors, something. Uh, we have spikes, so every time we do a release, we get a new batch of contributors that kind of get the numbers up. And we have actually had some interesting development happening, some outstanding contributions. Marcin, one of our, one of our core developers, this fall, he actually ported the full Oniguruma regular expression engine. And um, Oniguruma is the expression engine that lies behind regular expressions in Ruby 1.9. It's very large. I think it's, uh, the C implementation is around uh, 120,000 lines of C code. And this is a full Java port. It, just as a side effect, it actually ends up being the fastest regular expression engine available on the Java platform right now. So things like this kind of end up happening as a side, side result of doing a good Ruby implementation. It's really Really, really, really simple to get started with JRuby. If you want to try it out, you download the distribution. You, at that point, you actually get the Ruby standard library, you get Ruby gems, you get Rake. You unpack it and you add the binaries to the path, the bin directory to the path. And then you can just go on using it using the JRuby command. You can use it in several different directories. As long as you have one canonical JRuby command, that's fine. You can install gems. Either you can do gem install if you don't have regular Ruby install. You can do jruby-s gem install. This will use the gem that comes with jruby. And that's really it for getting started. And this is just an example of how easy it actually is with Java 6 to call out to Ruby code from Java. You create a new script engine manager. You get that engine by name. And then you evaluate the code. And what you get back here is actually the result. You, what you will get back here is an unwrapped nil object because putz actually returns nil. So it won't get any interesting from, from this evaluation. But you can imagine actually doing some, say, for example, you can imagine creating an interface implementation in, implemented in Ruby that you return from this evaluation and using your code. In general, Using JRuby is easier if you let the Ruby layer drive the Java layer. You can do it this way, but the easiest way is actually running it from the JRuby side. So, small demonstration of interactive Ruby. So how many, yeah, of course, all of the people who actually put up their hand saying they know Ruby have used interactive Ruby, right? So I'm going to show you the JRuby flavor of interactive Ruby. So I'm just going to resize this a little bit because I happen to know that this is going to be. So that's, is this readable? OK, good. So let's see. Sometimes this command takes an age to start because the Java loading of all this stuff, code loading on the Mac, has a tendency to be a little bit slower than it should be. Uh, it's just the first time, though. So this is IRB running in JRuby. So it's just one not one. Print hello Google. All the regular stuff that you kind of expect would work works. Um, but there's also this. Oops. There's also this that I can type wrong. Uh, require Java. Now requiring Java gives you access to the Java component of the system. So I can do Java line system dot out.println, hello, Google. And this will work as expected. So this is the way I can actually work with these classes. Um, printing out stuff might not be useful. I keep around, 
I keep around this console because I find myself a little bit frustrated by the Java docs in some of the security APIs, for example. Uh, so I keep IRB around open so I can try things out. So I can, for example, I can get all the algorithms. Since the available algorithms is different on all the systems in Java, this will always return different results. So in this case, we get a few different algorithms for message digests. Now what I get back is a Java object. This is a Java array. Uh, if you actually look at implementation of Java security security, you'll see that this method actually returns a primitive string array. But I can use something like grep to just find all the SHA implementations. So in this case, I'm running something that is typically Ruby, the grep command on a Java array. And we have all these kinds of integrations that help us do that stuff. So I can manipulate data from Java as if it was Ruby data. I can create a new um, uh, Java util hash map dot new if I want to. I can say, okay, at the index hello, I want to have world there. Okay, so age. You can still see in this funky syntax that this is still a Java object. This is still a Java util hash map. So all of that stuff kind of works and we've added lots of extensions to the Java integration to make it really, really obvious how you can work with stuff. And in many cases, if you use the Ruby, it just works. If you use the Java, you will find more and more shortcuts that kind of make sense. Um, so I have a tendency to, just as a typical example of what you can do, with a dynamic language that allows you to manipulate stuff at runtime. This means that I can create a new swing frame, for example. And I can set the size to 400 times 400, and I can show that. Show that. And I got a frame that I started from an interactive, interactive prompt, but that's not really it. I can actually work with this one too. So I can create a new button Java X dot swing dot J button, right? Hello, well, I need to come up with new examples. Okay, so I have a button that I added dynamically. Okay, so that's cool. Uh, next step would be to actually do something. So in this case, I wanna add an action listener. Mm -hmm. So let's see if I typed everything right. Okay, so the button text changed, the button pressed. So I'm now executing Ruby co code from a callback from right, right inside of Swing. And this just works. Uh, notice that I actually didn't implement any interface to do this because the action listener interface has one method. We can actually coerce a block to just do the same thing as would have happened. It, it kind of understands that the interface needs to be implemented and puts the block implementation as the action of that interface. There are a few shortcuts like this, but if you wanted to, you could have just implemented the interface, create a new Ruby class and create an instance of that. Works too. So this is the gist of the Java integration from JRuby. It kind of, the focus of it is that it should just work. One of the things that I really like about Ruby is the whole principle of least surprise. And this is really true for the Java integration stuff. I want, I want to be able to just assume that stuff works as I expect them to do. And that's kind of the guiding principle we're using. Yes? So that coercion, the one method on the class and the interface, it's creating the interface behind the scenes. Can you still do the trick where you just say define a function that is the action performed method and then pass that into the add action listener and it'll coerce that as well. So if you had an interface that had multiple methods on it, you could still just create anonymous functions or... So that's an interesting question. So what I, let's just, sorry? Not to hijack anything. <laughs> this is exactly what I told you to do, right? Uh, in the beginning of the talk. So let's see, so in this case, I'm not gonna actually, well, I'm gonna require Java. So the way I would do this, I would do it like, um, uh, say, uh, button action. And I would do that to be a proc that takes an argument. And then later on, if, if we assume that I still had the B 
the B button still available, I could do B dot add action listener button action. Now, uh, if you know Ruby, you know that the ampersand is actually coercion to a block. Actually, it coerces a proc into a block. So I'm, I'm doing exactly the same thing as I did the last time. It's just that I kind of gets around it by saving, saving the block inside of a variable. So this is the way, one of the ways I could do it. Um, another way I could do it is actually I could do java.awt.event.actionListener.impl. Uh, this is something we've added, which will create an anonymous implementation of the interface. Um, this anonymous implementation is kind of created with using dynamic proxies, and uh, the way it will work is you can use it on either interfaces with just one method, like action listener. In that case, actually, it's no difference. You can use it on any interface, and you will get back an anonymous class. Every method on that interface will invoke this block. The name of the method invoked will be the first parameter, which is the underscore here, because I don't care about that since I want to do the same thing on all of them. So this is the equivalent of an anonymous implementation, except that this is actually implemented in Ruby. So the question I was actually asking was more about, um, so if you define a function in the scripting environment, then the, the current you know, IRB object, this, um, gets that method. So via duck typing, if you pass this as the current interpreter, like main object into the method, will it be able to duck type the method signature and call it? for any given interface implementation? Uh, no, uh, the, the coercion actually happens just for blocks. So you would have to, what, what you could do, of, uh, of course, you can use Ruby. So you can always do, say if I wanted, uh, say P, the, or putts to be called, I could do method putts. And I think I can do to proc on that one, right? Yeah, so I can call method puts and to proc, and then I could, do, actually, yeah. So I could just do but b dot add action listener, and I could do the ampersand, and then I could skip the to proc. So this would do the same thing. This would actually call puts and pu uh, print out the argument. Is that what you were asking, or did I misunderstand again? Okay, so good. Okay, so let's see. There was it. Okay, so that is kind of the interaction. The, the, as I said, the guiding lines is that the Java interaction should just work. Now this means that the Java interaction, I, I just show you swing classes, I showed you collection classes and stuff like that. It also means that more complicated stuff works. You can do this with EGBs if you like that kind of thing. You can do it with JMX, you can use it with, uh, you know, I don't wanna get into all those TLAs, but you know, you can, if you can imagine a Java TLA, you can use this with it, it works. So let's get back to some of the issues that we're actually trying to solve. I mean, the, this were not the rationale for creating JRuby from the beginning, but they, they are kind of the guiding light for us to continue working on JRuby because we believe that we actually solve problems that have not been solved in Ruby 1.8 and Ruby 1.9, and we wanna solve these problems because they are kind of in a way of Ruby actually getting any traction. Um, Ruby has some traction right now, but we, at least in ThoughtWorks, we believe that Ruby could get so much more traction than it does right now. And these things are kind of in a way. So, we have threading. Uh, Ruby 1.8 has green threads. That means that they don't scale. That means that when I run Ruby on this lovely machine, which has got two cores, I don't really get my full money's worth. Um, C libraries can't, won't yield, uh, and the scheduler is kind of, kind of basic. In Ruby 1.9, this is getting fixed by using native threads, but they still have the global interpreter lock, which means that no native threads will run at the same time. So I will actually not have a solution to this. And as far as I understand, the global interpreter lock is not going to go away um, because so many extensions rely on the way the threading features work. There is no synchronization, no mutexes in any of the Ruby C code or the C extension code. And there are just too many extensions to handle this correctly. Uh, we kind of uh, fake this issue out by not caring because we are using Java threads as Ruby threads. That means that they are native, they are parallel. And since all of the code in JRuby is Java, it means that we get the same 
threading semantics for the Ruby implementation as you would get from Java. So extensions need to, okay, so if you write an extension, yeah, you need to synchronize the way you do in a Java program. Um, and everyone is kind of used to that when they write Java code, so we don't really need to do anything specific to handle the problem. Unicode uh, gets, actually gets a solution in 1.9. It's kind of the full Monty solution, meaning that not necessarily only Unicode or UTF-8, but you actually get all the, any encoding you can imagine you can actually use in Ruby 1.9, and all different strings can have their own encoding, and they can kind of float around in the same area and have fun together. That is very nice. It's kind of hippie. Uh, we don't want to go that far, so we use Java's Unicode. So once again, we fall back to the Java platform. It's, it's just stuff that we get for free for being on the Java platform. I'm going to talk about performance a little bit more later, but stuff is to say right now, Ruby 1.8, kind of the, the motto is that Ruby 1.8 is fast enough but it routinely finishes last. And there is no real plans to improve this. Uh, the improvements in Ruby 1.9 is happening. Um, I saw the talk that Matt gave last week. Uh, if I remember correctly, he said there were improvements on several benchmarks from five to 100 times in performance, but the general performance improvements for applications were more like 1.5 times. So this is 1.5 times for a new virtual machine. Um, there are other things that aren't really solved by the 1.9 release. Uh, for example, you only have the implicit ahead of time compilation that happens inside of the engine. There is no way of doing ahead of time compilation and dump out the byte codes. There is no just in time compiler and so on. So I'll go back to the general answer to this, to this part later. Um, memory management. I actually, I did a talk at PowerSet yesterday PowerSet is doing some really cool stuff, and uh, my question, what's your main problem with Ruby? And their main problem was memory, because the interpreter kind of leaks. It's got a very, very simple garbage collector, and it's not really, it's not really fit for use in large-scale environments right, right now, because the design is simple, and it works for simple apps, but eh. And Ruby 1.9 is not gonna change this. It's actually gonna worsen the situation because improved performance means more garbage, which means that the garbage collection problems are just gonna explode in our faces when we try to use it. Uh, and yeah, uh, this, this, this question, uh, this answer is actually getting a little bit old because <laughs> we, we just use Java's garbage collector. We have a few hundred options that can tune it. We have four or five different algorithms for the garbage collector in the current Java release and all of that works happily with our code. C is a lovely language for writing operating systems. It doesn't really scale, and it's got some problems that makes it unsuited to make extend, create extensions. Um, in the Ruby implementation, you see lots of code devoted to threading and garbage collection issues and so on. And in JRuby, well, the extensions are Java extensions. So once again, no problems like that. No explicit garbage collecting handling. The only threading handling that is explicit is the real synchronization we need to do. Oh, and then we have the politics one. You want me to switch to what? Um, this is gonna improve uh, later on in the game, hopefully, uh, with time, but that's not really quick enough to actually get real traction. There are also lots of Java applications in the world and so many Java frameworks, it's kind of like I would say that the Java libraries are definitely approaching Perl CPAN in completeness and, and comprehensiveness, and I would say that they are much better in stability uh, and quality than Perl CPAN is, um, just straight over the board. So, which is why we're, one of the reasons we're running on top of Java implementation, credibility by association, by just running on top of Java, it makes it easier for us. And we find that the regular Ruby implementation actually have an easier situation because we exist. Now, companies that wouldn't use Ruby are actually switching to the regular Ruby interpreter because they know they can fall back on JRuby and proven Java technology if they need to. So it's kind of a false thing. It doesn't really solve anything for real, but this is more about perception. Um, and it's actually funny, we, we have some real stories about where this really helps us. 
we did some work at a large financial institution. Um, and most of the people really, really wanted to, really wanted to have JRuby. They really wanted to have real Ruby on Rails. I mean, they, they were developers and they saw the benefits of using Rails in their environment. And they couldn't because their management didn't really allow them to use another language. They were based on Java. So what actually ended up happening was that they did it in JRuby on Rails. They gave it to the IS department. They said, okay, so here, this is our application. It's this really large, cool Java application. It runs on application servers and have all these uh, cool Java features and so on. And oh, we have this long configuration file with it, um, which is one way of doing it. It worked in this situation and the management is happy. So then we have the performance. Performance is usually well, fast enough is good. That's a good answer in many situations because performance isn't really all that important in most cases. But at the end of the day, you will end up in a situation where sometimes it actually is important. So our general numbers right now, JRuby 1.0 in June was actually two times slower than Ruby 1.86. Uh, the 1.1 1 .1 beta 1, that was about Javapolis time, uh, December. That was two times faster. And current trunk is about five times faster. We're talking about, we are actually competing against Ruby 1.9 instead of Ruby 1.8 in performance right now. And we're doing this with full compatibility of the Ruby 1.8 language. Ruby 1.9, one of the reasons Ruby 1.9 is actually faster for many cases, for many of the benchmarks, is because they have removed features that were hard to optimize. So right now, we are actually going to stop working on performance and concentrate on other stuff for a while. When we get back to performance, we are going to target Java performance. We want to have equivalent Java performance for operations that are logically the same. I'm not sure we're going to get that close to Java performance, but we should get in at least a magnitude. Uh, one of the questions people always ask is about IDE support, and these are the IDEs that I know about right now, NetBeans, NetBeans Ruby IDE, Eclipse RDT, RadRails, Aptana, DLTK, ThirdRail, IntelliJ, JEdit, all of these support Ruby. And those are the, the, those are the ones that you can count as IDEs. I don't count Emacs and um, VI and TextMate as IDEs in this manner, because that's not what people really want to know when you ask about this. I happen to use Emacs only, but that's me. Um, IntelliJ is extremely interesting, actually, because they have specific JRuby support, not only Ruby support, but they had JRuby support. So when you refactor something, when you change the name of a Java class or a Java method, uh, IntelliJ will actually find your Ruby code that uses that Java class and refactor at that point, too, and back and forth like that, which is really cool. Um, overall, the regular Ruby refactorings in NetBeans seems to be really going well, too, uh, according to people who use them. Mm. Yeah, all of these actually use the JRuby parser because there is no other complete parser around and no one want to use the C parser from a Java program, right? So it's one of those nice side effects of doing the implementation. People can end up actually having a real Ruby parser that I can use, that I can integrate in their Java ecosystems um, without shelling out to another program. So the parser, right, this is the geek part of the presentation. The implementation, if you're interested in stuff like this, we have a handwritten lexer. It's kind of ported directly from Ruby. Um, JRuby started out as being a line-by-line -line port from the regular Ruby interpreter in 2001. Uh, the lexer is probably the part of JRuby that has changed the least since then. Um, well, I do say many changes since then, but many less changes than we have done to the rest of the code base. We haven't really refactored this part yet. We would love to be able to switch to Antler. Um, and there are some people getting really close with Antler Ruby grammars. They're not close enough. And the problem right now is that the, all the Antler grammars we have looked at happen to be more than twice as slow as our parser end to end. So I, I don't know why that is. And from the maintainability perspective, this is really, eh, eh, I don't want to touch that. And I mean, our, Right now, our, our parser, actually, so we have a parser generator that is a Yak-based. It's, uh, it's an old Java program called J. Um, it's Jack Bison-based. It's kind of a pain. 
The AST is quite similar to MRI. We have kind of changed a few things that were implementation dependent and didn't make sense. Um, we have lots of core classes. Uh, most of them map uh, straight on from Java classes to Ruby classes. Uh, string is Ruby string, array is Ruby array. And we use annotations to point out this. It's kind of interesting if you look at this because this stuff is things that you need to know about the Ruby method from the implementation perspective. This is all we really need to know. This information is spread out all over the MRI implementation. Uh, in most cases, it's not even verbalized. It's just a side effect of how the interpreter work. But we have actually put them here so we can al allow the compiler and the interpreter to use this information. Uh, for example, we have the framing and scoping, which we, in many cases, don't need. So when we don't need it, we can optimize away from that. If we don't need frame and scope information, we can omit the whole stack framing. We can just store local variables in local Java variables, for example. So that is kind of how our source code looks. We have lots of implementations, and we have an annotation saying JRuby method. We are looking at adding a few other annotations for documentations and other purposes. But those refactorings kind of go uh, get a little left behind after actual implementation of features. The interpreter is really easy. It's a switch-based AST walker. Uh, it recurses. Most of the code actually starts out interpreted, except for command line scripts that are compiled immediately. Uh, it's quite easy code, actually. If you want to learn, if you want to understand what Ruby does, what happens under the cover of a Ruby implementation, if you, if you don't know exactly what happens when a singleton class is created and, or what happens when you use the double left, the, the double angle bracket uh, syntax to get that the singleton class or something like that, I would say that the absolute best solution today would be to look at the JRuby uh, inter interpreter because that is straightforward Java code. MRI is fine uh, for looking at the C code. Rubinius is going to be really lovely as soon as all of the core is there in Ruby code. But right now, JRuby's interpreter is the only part that is really readable in my, implementation, in my interpretation, at least. Um, the same is not true about the compiler. The, this is kind of a mess, actually. Uh, it's a mess that is kind of necessary. It's, uh, Ruby is a complex language to parse, and it's even com more complex to actually compile down to Java bytecodes to get equivalent actions. We, uh, in one of those, we have a ju uh, just-in-time compiler. It was not really full-scaled. It was 25% finished or something like that. Um, current trunk has got a full Ruby compiler. Uh, from end to end, we can compile any structures in Ruby. And the compiler itself is just an AST walker. It emits the code structure. And we then have a bytecode emitter that actually generates Java classes and methods. And they are real Java bytecode. If you compile in a head of time mode, you will have a mapping from .ruby, uh, .ruby files to .class files. And they're not going to be real Java classes because a Ruby file doesn't really match to a real Java class. So it's more of a collection of methods. It's a bag of methods, so to speak. But we do have a main method for command line execution. In just-in-time mode, we need to actually create one in-memory class for each separate method we are compiling. There's no other way of doing it, really. So. These are a few of the compilation uh, optimizations we can do to actually get some really good performance. We pre-allocate cached li Ruby literals. We use Java uh, bytecodes to improve the local flow control in many cases. Um, not many people know that if you use an explicit return in Ruby code, it will actually be slower than using the, explicit, the implicit return at the end of the file. Uh, that doesn't happen in JRuby because we use the same operation at both times. We try to use Java local variables because the performance of these are really, really good. Uh, but we can only do it when we don't have any closures that are going to be used in other places. So eval and binding and stuff like that just kills performance. Uh, and it's no, there's really no way around that. Um, but in most cases, in most code, you don't need that stuff. So your performance is good because we can optimize that stuff. We use right now monomorphic inline method cache. We are looking at possibly implementing a pick. Um, I'm not sure if that's going to happen for one of one, but if we do, that's going to improve performance even more. So just to give you a small example of the kind of performance we're talking about. Let's see. So I have 
we, we kind of try to have a really good test suite. So let's see, we have lots of benchmarks here. One of the more interesting ones is actually Meta Dispatch, because Meta Dispatch is at the core of the whole environment. So let's see where Ruby 1.9 is with Meta Dispatch. <laughs> so let's see if this takes an argument. No, it doesn't. Okay. So this is, uh, these are a few different things. We have a control first. That one was really slow. Okay, interesting. So you know what? I'll let this run in the background and we can get back to the presentation. So remind me we are having a benchmark running. In the meantime, I can continue talking about some things about the implementation. POSIX has been a problem for a long time for us because Java doesn't really support all the stuff you can do uh, in a POSIX system. So in many cases, normal Ruby things that we expect doesn't really exist in JRuby. Uh, native extensions are not supported, and well, interaction with C is kind of painful overall, all, of, all in all. Uh, then we find a library called JNA, uh, Java, Java Native Access. It's kind of, it's kind of like DL to do dynamic loading, uh, and the main thing about it is that we don't need to compile stuff ourselves. We don't need to write C code to interact with this stuff. We can just write the stubs in Java, and we can call C, method, C methods. So we have actually implemented quite a lot of POSIX compatibility like this. Mm, and we are also thinking about doing this for native extensions for the most important ones. I'm not sure we're going to do that. But JNA actually allows us to do lots of stuff. Uh, some interesting stuff like Unix domain sockets. And uh, we actually implemented fork in the JVM. I'm not sure if we should have that in the code base because if someone kind of tries to fork when you're running an application on production mode on an application server, something really big and honking, you can end up having a really interesting situation when you're trying to fork that in memory. So I'm not sure if we're going to do that. Okay, sorry about going back and forth like this. Wow. Ruby 1.9 is really, really slow for this one. So this, is, this test case is kind of interesting. Define method uh, is when you define a method and you give it uh, a block to, to actually have as implementation for that one. So as you can see, it's, it's really stable. Uh, it has this exactly the same timings for everything. So I'm going to kill this process. Uh, oh, no. Yeah, right. Ruby 1.9 can't be killed by control C. <laughs> Lovely. So let's do it another way. Okay. I don't know why Ruby 1.9 is doing this. Okay, so now you have seen Ruby 1.9. So let's see what we have. We want to have the server flag, but that's not really, that's really all we actually need. Um, it, as it turns out, the server flag in uh, Java 6 especially gives us much better performance than, we, than, than I would have expected from something like that, actually. Um, the hotspot in Java 6 is actually really good. So let's see, this is Java, this is JRuby trunk right now, running as Ruby 1.9. So let's see the control, 0.05, and 0 0.08, I would say, something like that. Uh, accessing the fixed number and calling to I, that is six seconds for Ruby 1.9, one second for JRuby. Calling self's foo uh, is eight seconds. Yeah, eight seconds for Ruby 1.9 and seven seconds for JRuby. And finally, define method method is 31 seconds. And for JRuby, the winner timing is three seconds. So for this benchmark, we're actually faster on everything except for the control. Uh, and in one case, we're actually 10 times faster than Ruby 1.9. So we're actually talking about a significant improvement. And this benchmark, if you're interested in actually seeing what we're testing here, bench method uh, dispatch uh, this code, so define method method. This defines an empty method with an empty block and invokes that lots of times. 
The other ones are kind of similar. This one defines uh, something on the top, top self, top um, self that returns self, which is actually the most, this is the quickest operation because we always have the self. Returning nil is slightly less efficient than returning self. And then we have the A to I. And then we have the control up here, which is just accessing. So this is a control for this one because we actually need to access the A local variable to be able to call stuff on it, but we don't want to, yeah, you understand the benchmarking process here. So actually, that was much better than I expected. I was amazed about how much faster we were in some situations compared to Ruby 1.9. Um, it's interesting, the, the, the defined method benchmark is actually faster on Ruby 1.8 than it is on Ruby 1.9, but we still have a significant performance increase uh, compared to them. And this is kind of one of the most central benchmarks because method dispatch is the core of an object-oriented language. The one thing you're doing all the time is method dispatch all over the place. So if we get this this fast, and we are actually working on getting it even faster, we can improve general performance all over the board just by doing that. I told you that the Java integration stuff, yeah, actually I've talked about all this stuff, so I'm gonna swing by that one. Um, if you are doing any JRuby stuff, if you wanna take a look at JRuby, and you wanna look at the internals, there are a few things you can do by doing require JRuby. Uh, one of them is, this uh, method called AST4. Uh, it used to be called, actually there is still a method called that way. It used to be called parse, but I prefer AST4 uh, because this is just, it takes an expression or a block and it returns the Java AST, the JRuby AST for that. And what you can do with this AST, you can actually modify the AST and you can execute that AST from this module. So. It's not really Lisp style macros because uh, Ruby has uh, about 100 different nodes uh, and they are quite different and quite irregular. So you won't do the same kind of macros, but you can actually inspect and change a few things if you put an effort to it. Uh, you compi can compile stuff with the JRuby compiler. What you get back is, is a compiled script that you can use to inspect the bytecode. <clears throat> And then you have the more interesting stuff. You can get the current runtime, and you can also get the Java integration equivalent of a Ruby object by calling reference. Now, what you can do with that one is kind of neat, and it's not something I really kind of recommend for, for actual usage, but what you can do is that you can freeze a string and you can get the reference to that string and set the frozen status on it to false. You can create a class, you can create a new object, and you can get a reference to that one, and then you can set the meta class of that object. Actually, in effect, that becomes the become command of Smalltalk fame. You can get all the methods of a class like this and actually change the meta table at runtime if you want to, but that one is not really as compelling as that one because you can actually do this through Ruby methods. Um, all of this is evil stuff, but it's kind of useful uh, if you want to learn how the implementation actually works. So, I'm gonna skip over Rails if not anyone raises their hand and really wants me to talk about Rails. <laughs> Sorry? Rails 2.0, how does that work on JRuby? Rails 2.0, if that works with Ruby, in JRuby? Yeah. Yes. Performance, how does it? Yeah, um, so, so the Rails performance is slightly less than, than the rest of the performance. So these benchmarks indicate very good performance over the board. Uh, we, there is some part of Rails, and this is true for both Rails 1.2 and Rails 2.0 that we haven't been able to identify that causes performance to drop. That means that we are still faster with JRuby. We have a smaller memory print than doing the equivalent uh, de deployment with mongrels, but it means that we are not as fast as we should be. We should be two to three times faster. Right now, we can, maybe we have 120% on one, the Ruby 1.8 in general. It's kind of hard to benchmark, though, because we don't have anything that we can use as a reference for benchmarking. This is actually something we are working on getting, some, getting together something that we can use as a reference, that we can use as a reference for numbers, that we can actually improve the performance uh, with focus on Rails performance because it's important that we find this bottleneck. There is something strange going on. Yes? So you're talking about 
runtime performance, I assume you say 120%. How yeah. much better is the memory footprint? So the memory footprint, it kind of depends on what you're doing. Uh, if you're doing stuff that cycles lots of methods uh, and, and creates new methods uh, uh, quite a lot at runtime, the compiler will take up more perm gen space because classes go in the perm gen space. But overall, with, uh, compared to Mongol, do, Paul, do you remember? David has told us about this. Uh, I don't have the numbers. We're not talking magnitudes of difference. We're not talking, we're maybe talking half the memory footprint to, to get the same requests per second, something like that. Yes? So how do you actually deploy a Rails application with JRuby? Do you run it inside an app server like Tomcat? Um, so let's see, do I actually have this somewhere? Uh, no. So I was planning on doing some demonstrations, but I'm running out of time, so I'm going to skip that one. It's not really an interesting demonstration if you've seen the, if you've seen the Rails, um, Rails, podcast, the Rails uh, screencast when they do a blog. So the thing about it is that Rails works exactly like it does on regular Ruby, but you have a few different uh, deployment options. Uh, first of all, you can deploy exactly like you could do with regular, um, regular Ruby, but you don't want to have 10 mongrels running in their own JVM. So there's another way that you can use a mongrel cluster that actually runs inside of the one JVM but uses different runtimes. Since JRuby is by, by design multi-virtual machine, so you can use more than one JRuby version, virtual machine inside of the same. Uh, actually, one of the fun things we do in our test process is that we use JRuby scripts to start new JRuby runtimes inside of those JRuby scripts, and we script them from the outside to do tests on the internal runtime. We can do all that stuff because we don't have any shared state. We don't have any singletons. Now, Mongrel cluster works kind of if you're stuck in a Ruby mindset, but there are two ways of doing stuff that is much more convenient. The first one is to do, um, use something called Glassfish. You have heard of Glassfish, right? So Glassfish is really cool, and they have a gem, a gem that is 2.2 megs large. You install it saying, gem install Glassfish. And what you get back is a Glassfish Rails command that you can start any JRuby on Rails application with. You don't need to do any configuration. It just works from scratch. And you can do it in development mode. It picks up. You can start several runtimes. So you can try performance and so on. And you get the whole application server, the whole class fish in two megs of a gem. That is an interesting option. It's not necessarily good for deployment. It's good if you're going to deploy on a, on a class fish server that, that exists somewhere that someone takes care of. Then it's good to do that development locally in the same environment. But I would say the recommended way of doing deployment is by taking one of the existing, there are a few plugins for doing this, Warbler, JRubyWorks, and Goldspike. They allow you to package everything up into a WAR file. So they give you, you install them as a plugin, then you, you create some, you, sometimes you need to create some actual configuration to point out which gems you need. Um, because all of these create WAR files that are actually self-contained archives that contain the JRuby runtime and all the gems needed, all the libraries needed. So you need to create a WAR, you need to point out the gems that need to be included. You possibly need to change your web.xml and then you get a WAR file out that you just deploy. The process is extremely simple, and you get a WAR file that can be deployed in any compliant Java web application container. This is the preferred way of doing it. You, ha you can have a few other ways of doing it too. Right now, for example, Mingle, which I'm coming to in a few slides, is a bundled application that we bundle, and we send that bundle so people can install it locally. And the way that works is basically that when it starts up, it starts up an internal Yeti um, that serves Ruby uh, that uh, handles the JRuby runtimes using um, using the Gold Spike servlet, which is it's a Rails servlet that allows you to say all of these projects kind of use the Rails servlet to to actually serve the Rails uh, content. So those are the options, and the best one for real production is to just push out the push out a WAR file and deploy that the way you would do any job application. Because in that case, you also get all the mon monitoring benefits, you get all the management benefits, you get all the clustering, you get security, you get uh, some of the transaction support. You can get all of that for free by just putting it in a WAR file. So uh, a few different things that kind of can be useful to, um, to know about around the JRuby ecosystem. Uh, um, outside of Rails, there, are actually, there is actually a world outside of Rails. 
Um, one of the parts that I like to t think about, and I think I've been test infected since I joined ThoughtWorks. I, I thought a lot about tests before that, but uh, yeah. Um, so in good ThoughtWorks uh, manner, I have created my own uh, testing framework. This is a testing framework that doesn't really create anything from scratch. It's just a bundling of stuff. It puts things together um, and makes it really easy for you to use Ruby frameworks to test your Java code. So this is for those situations where maybe you need to have Java code in your main product for some reason, but you have some flexibility to use something else for tests. So JTester glues JRuby together uh, with RSpec, test unit, Dust, Mocha, and a few other libraries. So it gives you flexibility in which test framework you want to use. It doesn't really matter. You get Ant and Maven 2 integration. And um, you can also interact back with JUnit and TestNG tests that you have written earlier that you want to include in your stuff. So, and all of this generates a unified output if you want that. Uh, the RSpec support actually have support for stories. So if you want to do behavior-driven development with stories as acceptance criteria, uh, this is a very nice way of doing it. Active Record is nice. It's simple. It's not scalable. Um, Hibernate is. So we are working on something to kind of put the easiness of defining stuff in Active Record and working with Active Record. Uh, and the easiness of the Ruby language together with Hibernate. So this is just a proof of concept. Uh, the project is still going on, but we don't really have the resources to put lots of man hours behind it right now. Uh, the purpose is basically to be able to do something that is in spirit like Active Record, but uses the base of Hibernate, and also allow you to reuse your existing investment in Hibernate. Yes? That has to be run inside of JRuby. This is a JRuby thing, yes. You could imagine possibly doing that with RJB or something like that, but it wouldn't really be feasible. You can do it, but it would be painful to say the least. Um, so this actually depends on having Hibernate, uh, the Hibernate libraries on a class path. I use this Java integration, the Java integration features of JRuby. Um, we have discovered that Java is a very good platform, but it's not the best platform in the world for dynamic languages right now. So we're working on improving the situation by JSR 292, uh, something we call JLR and the DaVinci machine. Um, and all of these kind of aim to, to provide more cool stuff in the next Java version that allows other implementations to live well. Um, the most important one is the dynamic invocation, invoke dynamic. You have method handles, anonymous classes, faster reflection, escape analysts, all of this stuff is kind of important. And then you have the more cool stuff that is kind of probably not going to happen, but could be interesting if it happened. Interface injection, real mix-ins in the Java platform, continuations, value objects. Tuple types might possibly happen, actually. Tail calls would be really good for many languages. I'm not sure if tail call optimization is going to happen or not. But all of this is going to be, is being prototyped in the DaVinci machine right now. <clears throat> Finally, I just want to show a few examples of stuff where people actually using. Ah, sorry. Yes. Uh, so, like, maybe eighty percent of that stuff is already in CLR, like in Mono and stuff like that. So, does that mean, like, for Iron Ruby and Ruby.net, that they're going to be faster than JRuby on some of these things because they don't have to do as much jiggery poker? So, I would posit that most of this stuff is not in the CLR. Is it? I don't think that most of this stuff is available in the CLR. Value no, no, no. The dynamic invitation uses dynamic call size from DLR. It's a library on top of CLR. There is no support in the CLR or in Mono for actually for doing this. So this is just a library level on top of the CLR. There is no support in the actual virtual machine for these things. So what we're talking about here is actually a new bytecode. Oh, okay. So that's going to change the story. The way the, the DLR stuff do, does things is that they, one thing they do have is method handles. And uh, the dynamic call sites uh, they have, is, it's, a <clears throat> it's a class. It's a generalized class that allows them to quickly and performantly switch out method handles. Uh, but they don't have support from the virtual machine, so they don't get any actual just-in-time compilation and so on. So I would say <clears throat> if we get this, um, actually, even if we don't get it, we still are in a better situation than the CLR for performance right now for the simple reason that the CLR is not 
Um, this is stuff that was actually reported back from the lang.net event in January. The CLR doesn't do much of the hotspot optimization that Java does currently. Java's hotspot does lots of interesting stuff that CLR still doesn't do. So general performance is going to take some time for, for the CLR to catch up. Do you mean hotspot in Java 1.6 specifically? Or no, in, uh, Java 1. in Java in general, uh, in Sun's JDKs. The Java 6 hotspot is more advanced, but still the Java 1.4 hotspot is more advanced than what you can find in actual CLR implementations. Oracle actually released mix.oracle.com, and that is a JRuby on Rails site. We built it in six weeks, and it's kind of sharing network, idea sharing, networking, Q&A, production uh, environment for all of Oracle's customers. And it runs on top of the full Oracle stack, and one of the reasons was that the production staff wouldn't actually be able to get MRI into the uh, resulting stuff. And they also wanted to be able to run on top of the full applic Oracle application stack. So this is actually running with using, let's see, Oracle SSO, Oracle Directory Server, Oracle Apache, Oracle Linux, uh, Oracle RDBMS, and Oracle Application Server. So it's kind of the red stack from top to bottom. Sun is doing something called MediaCast that is kind of a media marketing distribution channel using JRuby on Rails. And then we have ThoughtWorks, uh, who's released a product called Mingle. Our, this is kind of a screenshot of how the general interface works. It's the first JRuby project to ever, product to ever be released. It was released in June. The 2.0 version is gonna be at some time in March. Um, it's kind of for collaboration and agile workflow, but it doesn't restrict you in any way. Uh, Cards are basically the only the abstraction you have, and you can use that to do quite flexible things, actually. Um, we use that for, we use JRuby for several reasons. We ended up in a situation where we needed a library that we couldn't get to work on both uh, Linux and Windows in the regular Ruby distribution. So we went to JRuby and used the Java library and that works perfectly. Then we ended up using some other things too. For example, Darby we used for a long time. We used JRuby to be able to actually protect and um, encrypt the source code of the Ruby application. And we're probably gonna go away from doing that and just use pre-compilation instead because pre-compiled JRuby bytecode is incredibly unreadable. It's better than the best obfuscator. You're not gonna actually understand what's happening there without some serious analysis, uh, which is nice. JRuby allowed us to do easy bundling too, so all of these kind of benefits. So that's actually the end of my talk, and this is the book I mentioned earlier, and I didn't actually add any resources. <coughs> Um, because all this stuff is very easy to find with a well-known search engine. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, right. So, are there any more questions? Yes. Okay, if we can use the uh, mic so we get it for the video. Uh, so, when you marshal between the JRuby interpreter and Java when you're, like, making new buttons and stuff, like, what's the what's the overhead for the marshalling between the two? Like, how many objects are made and thrown away? Are the Java integration marshalling. Re yeah, like yes. when you made a button and whatever, like how, how many extra objects are made and stuff like that? So at creation of new objects, um, the, the most stuff that happens, that's a good question actually, uh, because that's the area we're gonna uh, spend lots of time after the one of one release. Now, the Java integration features are extremely complex right now. Mm -hmm. uh, the implementation have kind of grown organically when we need new features. Um, so right now, uh, two times new objects have been created. First time when you actually uh, use a class, a Java class for the first time, at that point uh, lots of different objects are created to actually represent the Java methods and, and all the metadata structure that we need to be able to do the Ruby kind of features on top of the Java stuff. Okay. <clears throat> and then I think two, pro two objects are usually created for every one Java object you create like that because they always need at least one wrapper. I, as if I remember correctly, you don't need more than one wrapper, but all of this is gonna be revisited. We are gonna rip it all out and redo it because now we know how the interface is gonna look. We know how, how the integration is actually gonna work. We just need to implement it bet better and more performant. And do those wrapper objects have the same, or I'm assuming they're wrappers, do they have the same lifetime as the object itself, or are they made and thrown away relatively quickly? Uh, that's a good question. I, I would assume, I, I'm, so they don't have the same lifetime as objects if, if, 
the wrapper objects have the same lifetime as the uh, as the objects are referenced, as long as the ref objects are referenced from the Ruby side of stuff. So if you pass something back into Java and, and that local variable in Ruby goes out of scope, yes, the wrapper objects is going to be collected. Okay. And is there any objects that, like this that are made for just method calls after you create the, the, uh, the, the Java object within Ruby? So if you make an object and then you call a method, is there going to be any extra GC overhead just from calling methods on that object that you already created, or no? no uh, so, so the only thing that's going to happen is the wrapping or unwrapping of parameters to that call. So that might be something there. But we are, we are moving quite heavily towards lightweights, and that's also one of the major restrictions we are looking at making. To actually make, right now, everything is wrapped. But we want to make it lightweights. Right. So we can actually work around. Uh, there, there are some challenges in doing lightweights in implementation. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think that, especially when you have a language like Java that doesn't actually have a unified object structure. Um, but we think we can work around it. And it's going to be lots of benefits in many cases, especially no wrappers and stuff like that, right. of course. So does the hotspot, one last question, does the hotspot VM uh, in 1.6 or 1.7 or whatever, in line to the point where the method invocation overhead for these wrappers is non-existent, or does it not inline at all? Uh, in between. Uh, it does inline and it does improve performance of invocation of these, but the, um, the problem for Hotspot is that our usage patterns for this stuff is kind of not what Hotspot expects. So the problem, th this is a problem with Java 1. It's not a problem with Java 1.6. It's a problem with the algorithms used up till Java 1.6, because the Hotspot uh, optimizes based on current Java idioms and what current Java idioms compile into, which is why you should write simple Java code because that is easier to hotspot compile. Now, Java 1.7 is actually going to be much smarter and optimize all kinds of bytecodes combinations uh, in a much smarter way without taking into account idioms like that. So that's going to improve the situation. And it's kind of funny, when, when, we, uh, when we upgraded, when we started testing performance in 1.6 instead of 1.5, uh, just the hotspot and running a server it gave us twice the performance just by upgrading. We didn't do anything. That's the, that, that, that's the best kind of performance uh, improvement I like, the ones where I don't have to do any work for them. Yes, any more questions? Uh, two quick questions. Uh, one, in terms of compatibility, is it generally safe to assume that pretty much any uh, Ruby application or Ruby library that doesn't use native extensions uh, works with um, JRuby as well. Yes. So if I wanted to use something like uh, the Merb web framework with... Uh, yeah, Merb is a good example of something that actually has native extensions. Oh, okay. But Merb, <laughs> so Merb, but Merb works because we have ported native extension. Uh, Merb uses the, um, the HTTP parser. Um, from Mongrel, which is actually the only C component of Mongrel. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a Regal state uh, machine. And since uh, Regal, Regal is really cool, by the way. If you, if you, like, uh, if you like finite state uh, theory, uh, it's really nice. Um, since it has an output mode for Java, what we needed to do was a, essentially just port the small helper methods in the C Regal definition, and then we could just generate a Java parser for HTTP that worked as well. So that was actually a quick process. So um, since that is available, that means that Merb works fine. Oh, great. Uh, and another quick one. Is it possible to share gems between the regular Ruby uh, VM and the JRuby VM on the same system? Yes. Uh, we don't generally do it because there are lots of gems that are kind of JRuby specific. And if uh, in some cases, uh, in some cases it actually happens because there are the way they are, if, if you use JRuby to install a gem that is Java specific into your shared gem repository, when Ruby, Ruby's Ruby gem tries to load the manifest for all these, because it keeps a manifest running of all the install stuff, right? So when it tries to load that, it's going to barf on seeing, well, I can't have this in my manifest. And then it just can go poof and say, it's actually not going to say anything, if I remember correctly. It just barfs on you. So um, if, if you want to have shared, that's fine. But be careful to not put any Java-specific stuff there. Right, makes sense. OK, any more questions? Yeah, right, Dave? Um, so compatibility questions. Um, Ruby Coco is one. Sorry? Ruby Coco. Uh, sorry, I don't hear what you said. Oh, Ruby Coco. 
Ruby the, the framework on Leopard okay. for writing Cocoa apps in Ruby. Oh, Cocoa. Oh, uh, sorry. Ruby? Yes. Does that work? Uh, I haven't tried it. Uh, I would assume it uh, kind of extends, uh, it uses native extensions, but there is a Java interface to interfacing with Objective C on. That's uh, been Mac, deprecated. Right? What? I think that's been deprecated. All oh, right. It? And that stopped anyone? Mm -hmm. uh, sorry. <laughs> Oh. Deprecation never stops anyone. Right. No, so yeah, uh, as far as I know, no one has actually tried to interface JRuby with Cocoa right now. Um, there, as long as there is some way for us to get them there, it should be possible. But on the other hand, Apple has actually spent lots of time writing integration things and writing lots of C code and Objective-C to integra integrate Ruby with Cocoa. So I'm not sure that's going to happen in, not, in just right. a blink of the eye. Right. What about auto test? Auto test, um, yes. If I remember correctly, we had that working. Uh, there, there were one or two command line options we didn't support for a long time that kind of stopped it from working. Uh, we have fixed that. Cool. Any more questions? Okay, great. Great. Thanks well, for having uh, me thanks here. Thanks so much for having Nola. Thank you.